Good evening. My name is Candace, and I'm an event manager at Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of Town Hall and the University of Washington, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation featuring cutting edge research by UW grad students Sarah, Sarah Swieger, Emma Myers, and Tammy Van Neal. This is the fourth of six in our series, UW Engage Science, and we're so pleased to be able to offer this platform to these students and their important and engaging work. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank tonight's speakers for appearing to help make that possible. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture, where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight by donating or becoming a member. You can check out more of what's upcoming on our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Tonight's program will include three separate presentations with a time for questions at the end. Each presentation is about 20 minutes long and has visuals. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video player, so please submit those at any time. You can also text questions to 206-504-2857 as noted in the chat. If you can be sure to address the question to the presenter you intended for, that would be greatly appreciated. We can't guarantee that we'll get to every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. For those who would like to view the program with closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for re-watching immediately following the event. Uh, Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the North Coast Foundation, Windcoat Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Sarah Swieger is a fourth-year PhD student in the chemistry department at the University of Washington. Sarah's work sits at the crossroad, crossroads between chemistry, biology, and physics. Her research focuses on utilizing electrons that serve as magnetic rulers to understand the structure and function of proteins and how we can use statistics to determine the reliability of our measurements. Sarah is originally from Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Sweeker. Okay. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for the introduction. So as has been said, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my work using mini magnets to help scientists answer some big questions. Um, but before we get into all of that, I want you to first take a moment to mentally leave your computer behind and instead imagine you're laying on a picnic blanket next to Green Lake. You can picture the clear blue skies going on for miles above you, the sun embracing you in a hug that provides just the right amount of warmth on your skin. And despite being in a city, everywhere you look, you see varying shades of green. And you're not the only one who's taken the opportunity to get outside because the park is alive with activity. On the trees, the leaves are tilted up, absorbing as much sunlight as they can for photosynthesis. Bikers are riding by, their muscles expanding and contracting with every turn of their pedals. And friends stroll together, catching up on each other's lives, their neurons firing as they make conversation. So am I a scientist just daydreaming about escaping the lab or maybe do all of these things have something in common? At the core of everything I mentioned is a protein. Many of us are familiar with protein. We know it as one of the main staples of our diet. It provides us with energy to go about our day and helps us sustain our muscles. And while these are some of the more important functions of proteins, they actually represent only a very small fraction of what they do in our bodies. Beyond just meat and beans, proteins are large molecules that make up the foundations of all living processes. In the human body alone, there are more than 100,000 different proteins at work. This is not to mention all the jobs they do in every other living thing, uh, like helping the leaves on the trees itching to transfer sunlight into energy. So what are some of these other responsibilities? They cause chemical reactions that help us with things like digesting food. They transport substances through our body and across our organs. 
They play a crucial part in our body's defenses against things like viruses and bacteria. They send and receive signals that allow our brain cells to communicate with each other and with the rest of our body. And they even provide structure and help allow for movement. Now research across thousands of labs goes into understanding the complexities of how the human body works and often how to fix it when it breaks. At the core of many of these problems is a protein and developing an understanding of how that protein works or why it isn't working and what effects are caused downstream. And for scientists to be able to understand these big life processes means first understanding proteins, sort of like if you're designing a building, you need to understand what materials are best suited to the job before starting. We wanna move from these cartoon pictures to more realistic ideas of the individual proteins at the core of these processes. So rather than just knowing that they cause chemical reactions, I wanna look at an individual enzyme. An enzyme is just a researcher's word for a protein that causes a reaction. And we can do this for each larger job, replacing each function with a protein that makes it happen. Another important example, oops, sorry, that we can highlight is uh, antibodies. At the core of our body's defenses are antibodies, which you may have heard quite a bit about in the midst of COVID and the development of the vaccine. Antibodies are also proteins, just those specifically responsible for identifying and fighting off infections. For each job, the protein is structured differently and in a way that makes it uh, best perform its duties. These are still cartoons that I'm showing you, but now they show us the individual parts that make up the proteins and so that we can begin to develop a more detailed picture of how each piece interacts with each other to get the protein to function. Even these are just one example of what a protein may look like in each of these categories, which means scientists trying to understand what they look like and how they work in any number of scenarios have a very big task ahead of them. And this brings me to a really key point, which is that to understand how a protein works, a lot of times we must start by understanding its structure. What this means is that a protein structure is what allows it to do its job, but proteins aren't one trick ponies. They are constantly moving about and changing positions. And a lot of those changes in their structure are exactly what allow them to do their job. And so one example of this involves cancer and the success of certain chemotherapeutic drugs. One common problem with these uh, drugs is that tumors can develop a resistance to the treatment. So if we zoom into the cellular activity of the tumor, what we learn is that all cells have an outer layer called a membrane. And in these membranes are channels that pick and choose what to let in the cell, sort of like a bouncer at a bar checking IDs, deciding who to let in and who needs to stay out. These channels are proteins and they either may naturally possess or over time develop the ability to force out chemotherapy drugs from the cancer cells. And so, as I've said, as scientists, what we want to do is transform our cartoon pictures into realistic versions of what the proteins look like. When we do this, we can see the individual pieces of the proteins and learn about their movement and cooperation with other parts to do their job. What we find in this specific case is that the protein's ability to force out molecules is controlled by a change or movement in its structure. The downstream effects can all be traced back to this protein structure and how its movements allow it to do its job, maybe even a little bit too well. In our research then, we want to know as much as we can about the protein so we can use that knowledge and develop more effective drugs. So now remember, this is just one example of how learning about proteins on a fundamental level helps us tackle some very big problems. Now, proteins are a bit of an abstract idea for most of us. So for describing how we study them, I want you to imagine something a bit more familiar and tangible. We'll go with a lazy boy. If you're not familiar with these big bulky chairs, they have two structures to support different functions. When the lever is up, it simply functions as a comfortable chair for watching TV or chatting with friends. However, if you move the lever down, the parts of the chair rearrange. The back lowers down, the front rises up, and now its primary function is as a recliner for relaxing or taking a quick nap. This is the same chair. It has all the same parts, but depending on the way they're arranged, the object has different functions. This same basic idea applies to proteins. So now, as with many things, the work we can do is often dependent on the tools we have at our disposal. 
Many of the ways we study proteins allow us to get pictures of our proteins in one situation or position. And while that is important because it gives us a starting point, it certainly doesn't tell the whole story. We can return to our lazy boy. Say you had never seen one before and I showed you this picture. You would very reasonably think, well, that's a chair. It has one structure and one job. But if we took a picture of the same chair from another angle, you'd see new parts that are extremely important to understanding how it works. In the first picture, the lever isn't visible. So how could you know that the chair could move at all or what it did when it moved? Similarly, when we take pictures of proteins, we only get one view of an object whose movements are crucial to its entire existence. Not only that, but many of our tools require us to take proteins out of their homes where they're comfortable doing their jobs before we study them. We can again return to our trusty lazy boy. Now imagine you're trying to work, learn about how this lazy boy moves, but the only tool you have requires it first be stuck in a block of ice before you can test it out. I think you're gonna have a much harder time getting the chair to work in this case. And even if you did, it probably wouldn't really tell you how it works from the day to day. And this is exactly what we often do with proteins. We take them out of their comfortable world and stick them into a new rigid environment in our lab that makes it easier for us to study them. The information we get likely won't represent their normal everyday movements, which restricts how much we can apply our knowledge about them. So what I want to instead do is let my lazy boy sit in its natural environment and learn about how its structure changes as it functions throughout the day. So where my work comes in is trying to expand our toolbox for studying proteins so that hopefully we can get a more dynamic idea of how they work in their own environment rather than in these individual pictures in sort of unrealistic worlds. We do this using tiny magnets. Before we get into what exactly that means, I want you to think back to a time as a kid when you first discovered magnets, right? At first you hold them and they're as unexciting as any other everyday object. What you can't see is that even from a distance, the magnets are interacting with each other. But as you move the magnets closer together, you experience the magic that is magnetism. A very clear force arises between them. They're either drawn towards each other or they very clearly wanna stay apart. Either way, the closer you get, the stronger you feel this force. Rather than the magnets we're used to seeing, we can take tiny magnetic particles that exist in nature known as electrons that behave like our magnets and put them on a protein. Just like the force we feel changes when we hold the magnets close together or far apart, my particles feel different forces based on how close my protein holds them. And we can translate the amount of force into a distance using these magnets as, as essentially miniature rulers. So again, before we get into actual proteins, we continue to rely on our faithful lazy boy to describe these measurements. Say I attached my, magne my magnetic rulers to the ends of my chair. Just like any two magnets, they'll interact with each other based on how far apart they are on my chair. If my chair is in the upright position, I can measure the distance between them and the result is something like this graph on the right, where I have the probability or chance that my magnets are some distance apart from each other. Since I have just one chair and one set of rulers, the probability of my distance is a single peak for that one distance. But this isn't very interesting to me because it would be the same as taking just that one picture of the chair in one position, which is already what I've said I don't really want. With my little magnets, what I'm actually able to measure is a graph that shows a range of distances. And that's because when you shrink everything down to the size of our protein, we're not just measuring one protein or one set of distances, but a whole bunch of proteins with magnetic rulers attached. And the thing about proteins is they don't sit still. Sort of like people, they naturally fidget around moving their arms slightly or folding their legs. We wanna be able to see all these different positions and distances and learn about how they move. So our magnets measure all these distances and what we get is a curve or a distribution showing the chance of each distance. The more proteins in a certain position, the larger the probability that distance shows up on my graph. Maybe even more important than our protein's natural wiggles are the big movements, like when uh, we go from chair to recliner. My lazy boy doesn't just spontaneously flip from one position to the other, it needs my dad to plop down and flip the lever. Again, if I attach my tiny rulers, I can see how my distribution shifts to longer distances because my rulers are farther apart. 
Again, keeping in mind that I have a distribution rather than a single distance because there are a whole bunch of chairs with magnetic rulers, not just one. I can measure each separately or watch how my dad and lazy boy interact and see how the shape changes in my distance graph. Now switching from chairs to proteins, the method works basically the same way. Uh, the method I use is what's known as DEER and not the kind that you're thinking of. It's an acronym where the two E's are there because my tiny magnetic particles are called electrons. Here you can see my electrons are attached at different positions on my protein. One is just the protein by itself and the other is the protein with the new attached part called a ligand. When the ligand arrived, it caused the protein to move positions just like I had my chair in the sitting position, and then my dad sat down and flipped the lever to move to the reclined position. When the protein moves positions, it changes the positions of the electrons, and the force between them grows stronger, which means I measure a different distance and see how far the protein moved. What I get out is two distinct graphs that show me the probability of the distance between my magnetic rulers for each protein the blue being the distribution of distances for my protein by itself and the pink for the protein with the ligand attached. Just like with my dad and his recliner, a lot of the most interesting information is captured when I watch how the structure changes when my protein interacts with other molecules such as the ligand. Cool. I can see how the protein's positions change in the cell or in an environment very similar to the cell, problem solved, right? Unfortunately, no. The issue with us scientists is that once we learn something, we still aren't satisfied. We need to know how sure we are about what we're seeing before we decide if it's true or not. And this is where I come in. The trouble with research is that there usually is no answer key. Say I have my protein and I've attached my rulers. I run my experiments and what I get is four different distributions. How do I know which one is correct? Sorry. There are a lot of things to take into consideration. There's always gonna be some differences between any two experiments. Sometimes our data runs perfectly and other days there are issues that make running the experiments difficult and the quality of the data different. Maybe I made a mistake while conducting my experiment that I wasn't even aware of. Beyond just me, proteins are these dynamic moving things. It's possible that more than one of these could be correct. Um, but with what I have right now, I can't be sure just from looking at what I, sorry, excuse me. I can't be sure from looking at what I have now. I can't, and if I can't be sure, I can't make any conclusions or confidently learn anything new about my protein. So is there anything we can do about this or has everything just kind of been a waste up to this point? Well, that would be kind of a disappointing end. So one way we can tackle this problem is using statistics. And before digging into how we visualize uh, these with my graphs, I wanna to try to visualize it first with the weather. So being in Seattle, we are programmed to think about the clouds and the rain, but seeing as it's spring and we can see the light at the end of the gray tunnel, I want to plan a hike. And I want to know what is the probability or how likely is it that it will rain? Normally when we talk about probability, we talk about just one factor. So what is the chance of rain? But being a scientist, I want to use evidence to support my hypothesis. So instead of just asking how likely is it that it will rain, I wanna know how likely is it that it will rain if I wake up on the day of my hike and I see clouds in the sky? Or what is the chance of rain during the day if there are clouds in the morning? I can figure this out considering some probabilities I may already know from having lived in Seattle for a few years. Unfortunately, I know that 60% of rainy days start with clouds, but cloudy mornings are common. On a given spring day, we can say there's a 25% chance the day will start off cloudy. And we can say this is a usually dry month, so on any given spring day, there's a 10% chance of rain. Some of these values let us bring in information we know because things like the probability of rain or the probability of clouds will certainly depend on if we're considering the weather in Seattle in January or the weather in San Diego in July. Using all this information I already have, I can quickly figure out how likely it is that if I wake up on a cloudy day, that it will rain using this fun equation. But don't worry, I've already done the math. We can take the probabilities we already know and I can say there's a 24% chance of rain, even though it's cloudy, it's probably a good day to go for a hike. And so now using this same idea, 
instead of predicting the rain, I can take that information that I already know about our protein and combine it with my experimental factors to predict the probability or chance of certain distributions. Armed with st my statistics and evidence, I can generate thousands of possibilities of what my distributions might look like. Rather than looking at just one distribution from my experiment, I can take my experiment and compare it with thousands of possibilities. Some data gives us the same result pretty much no matter what, but other data struggles a lot more to get to the truth. Again, this could be the same protein, but there are a lot of factors that go into collecting my data. And say one day the stars align and I get data that gives me graphs where everything is quite certain. And even when I generate thousands of different uh, statistics, they all more or less look the same. But on another day, the world is working against my experiments, a situation a lot of grad students are quite familiar with, and the data just doesn't come up quite as nicely. Um, the more blurry or varied my statistics are, the less confidence I have in my results. Rather than only trust one plot, we can look at many and see which parts we're certain of and which parts we're not. In a more complicated graph, when I look at the whole picture, areas that are consistent are aspects of my protein structure I can trust to be true and make scientific conclusions from, while others I know to be more cautious and maybe go back and run more experiments before making any decisions. So using this method, we can not only expand our toolbox for studying proteins, but do so with a measure of certainty, allowing us to continue to explore how they operate and learn how that has larger impacts on the way we function in our day-to-day -day lives. So with all that, remember to keep stepping away from your computer and appreciate the beautiful living world around us. And maybe take, it, take a second to appreciate the tiny world operating beneath it and all that we're doing to still try to understand that world. So thank you. Great, right. thanks so much, Sarah. Um, if you have any questions for Sarah, just a reminder that uh, you can put those in the chat. Uh, you can also text them. Um, and if you're able to uh, make sure that you um, direct them to her so we know that they are for her at the end. All right, so our next speaker is Emma Myers. Emma is a finishing PhD candidate studying marine geophysics at the University of Washington. Her work focuses on characterizing the structure of the earth beneath the ocean and how the earth deforms along earthquake producing subduction zone faults to better understand the potential earthquake hazards. Um, Emma is from just outside of Seattle and likes to rock climb. Um, she's also never broken a bone, which will be relevant to her talk tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Emma Myers. Okay, great. So just over 20 years ago on the morning of February 28th, many Seattleites will remember the Nisqually earthquake shaking the city. There were really only a few things I remember from that day. Uh, one was being at recess and watching the balls on the shelf of the ballroom shake and the ground roll. Later hearing that my mom's flight uh, that was actually about to land pulled back up to land in Portland. And lastly, that my dad broke his ankle as a large group of his coworkers rushed down the stairs outside, which is definitely not what you should be doing in an earthquake. And so you could say that I might have always had earthquakes and broken bones kind of linked together in my mind since this day, even though when I checked this story with my dad, it turns out it was just a bad sprain. But for the sake of this presentation, we're going to pretend that he did. And you're probably still thinking, Okay, but how are earthquakes like breaking a bone? So let's first imagine you're an Olympic athlete. You've likely been training a significant portion of your life for this monumental event, pushing yourself constantly to get stronger and be your best. But even superstar athletes have limits if they aren't careful about listening to their bodies and push them too hard. So athletes can often develop small cracks in their bones called stress fractures, from this overuse of the body. People often try to push through them, to ignore them, and often they can just get worse with time, ultimately leading to a more significant broken bone. And since a broken bone is the last thing you would ever want to keep you from your Olympic dreams, if you could see a small fracture before it became a large catastrophic break, you'd probably wanna know, right? 
Of course, we don't necessarily need superpowers for this. X-rays and MRI imaging can definitely give us a better picture of what's going on at the first sign of discomfort. Now, one of the first most important things that we wanna understand with any sort of broken bone or an earthquake is how bad is it? And that's directly related to what is called the earthquake magnitude. The earthquake magnitude defines how large the earthquake is, which, res which relates to the resulting damage that you can see here on the left, from barely shaking a hanging lamp to destroying vulnerable cities. The Nisqually earthquake was a magnitude 6.8, which we would expect and did see uh, damage to buildings and severe shaking. However, earthquakes around the size of Nisqually only occur about 20 times a year across the entire world. Whereas magnitude three earthquakes, which is the smallest earthquake that a person can reasonably feel, they happen all the time. So you could think of this as how easy it is to barely roll your ankle. On the other hand, a magnitude eight or nine, these happen much less frequently, but can cause significantly more damage than a magnitude seven because the energy released is actually not linear. So if we imagine the energy released by a magnitude seven earthquake as this little red circle, we can actually say that that energy is really similar to say the Hiroshima bomb. So we can think of this as a significant broken bone, say your arm in a cast for a little while. We can then compare that circle to the energy representing a magnitude eight. And this increase in one in magnitude actually relates to an increase in energy by 10 times. So a 10 times stronger earthquake. And this would be similar to say the eruption of Mount St. Helens. This is a severe broken bone. Perhaps you need crutches and you can't walk situation. And finally, a magnitude nine, around the largest in the world, is then 10 times stronger than that magnitude eight or 100 times stronger than that magnitude seven. And this would be like the historic eruption of Mount Krakatoa, essentially our most catastrophic broken bone situation, maybe requiring surgery and a significant recovery time. And so as I said, earthquakes occur all around the world, but not everywhere. Monitoring them through time has shown that they occur within rather specific areas. You can see them along coastlines and throughout the oceans and sometimes even within continents, outlining tectonic plates. You can kind of think of this like the onset of pain someone would feel, letting you know something is going on that you might not be able to see on the surface, but indicating where a significant break could happen. And so we can see almost a direct correlation between these earthquakes and these tectonic plates. So these plates represent the outermost rigid portion of the earth. They're always moving relative to each other at plate boundary faults. Their motion is often characterized by a series of being stuck together, wanting to move, building up stress between them, and then finally breaking apart when they aren't strong enough to hold together any longer. When these plates break at this plate boundary fault or even within the plate themselves, uh, this is when earthquakes happen. And we can generally put all of these plate boundaries around the world into three different categories shown here in three different colors. So of these three types of plate boundaries, plates um, can first move apart from each other at spreading centers or mid-ocean ridges like the mid-Atlantic ridge, that divides the Atlantic deep in the ocean and actually appears at the surface, uh, crossing Iceland with this deep widening gash we can see from above. They can also move side by side along each other at strike slip faults, uh, such as the well-known San Andreas Fault in California. Here we can even see the relative motion of the two plates by how they displace features on the surface of the earth. So shifting that stream channel that's pointed to with the red arrow, we can see that it shifts towards us on one side and away on the other. Plates can also move together, sometimes colliding into each other and creating mountain ranges with some of the highest peaks like the Himalayas and Mount Everest. Other times when they're colliding, they actually dive underneath each other or subduct at subduction zones like the Cascadia subduction zone that reaches from Vancouver Island to Northern California offshore our west coast. So now we could kind of say that perhaps in a way bones are breaking all over the world all the time. And being from the northwest I care a lot about our local Cascadia subduction zone 
And my research strives to better understand the earthquakes or broken bone situations that we have here. So now I'm showing you a side view of the two plates at the Cascadia subduction zone. We have the Juan de Fuca plate beneath the Pacific Ocean diving underneath that continental North American plate. Now earthquakes in Cascadia can also be grouped into a few specific categories with respect to these two plates. So first we have shallow earthquakes, which happen when shallow fractures or faults in the North American plate break. These can be rather large earthquakes and would cause significant damage to our city centers because faults like these, like the Seattle Fault Zone, are very close to the surface. We can also have deep earthquakes, which happen as the Juan de Fuca plate bends and cracks as it's trying to dive into the earth. And this is actually what produced uh, the Nisqually earthquake in 2001. And these earthquakes are thought to occur more often than shallow ones. But the biggest earthquakes that are possible are along that plate boundary where the two plates meet and they have the most contact with each other. Essentially, they have more area where they're stuck called the lock zone and therefore a bigger area that can break rather than crack within each plate. And this area of the plate boundary is completely offshore the coast rather than near our most populated centers. But because it can be as large as a magnitude nine, it would still cause significant shaking and other hazards. And while these events don't happen very often, estimated every 300 to 500 years or so, with the last one occurring in the year 1700, this could certainly be considered our catastrophic Olympic dream dashing broken bone situation. Now, you've probably even heard this referred to as the big one in Cascadia. Uh, maybe you remember this slightly alarmist New Yorker article that came out several years ago um, describing the potential effects of this event. Most importantly, severe shaking and large tsunami waves uh, from the displaced ocean when these plates break apart beneath the seafloor. So to put this into context with what we've learned already, remember that based off magnitude of earthquake alone, a magnitude nine earthquake has the potential to be more than 100 times stronger than the 2001 Nisqually earthquake but it would also have destructive tsunami waves that would impact coastal communities like we can see here with the 2011 Japan earthquake. Now, I don't mean to tell you all of this to scare you, um, but really to tell you so we can understand the chances that earthquakes like this can happen. It's just like a doctor would wanna tell that athlete the chances they have for a broken bone, rather than keep us from enjoying the Northwest or that athlete from training, we instead can uh, we instead want to know if we can better see where and how these breaks can happen. And so while that athlete could get some more information from an x-ray or an MRI, what if we could x-ray the earth? Luckily we can. So my research tries to do just that. So before we can create these images, we have to get out to the area in question. So this is a photo I took two summers ago on a marine research boat off the Washington coast. I've always really loved going to sea and imagining the world beneath the surface of the ocean that we don't usually get a chance to interact with or really understand. But of course, we can't use a typical x-ray in this situation. We need some more specific gear. Um, and while I wish I could say it looked as cool as this, we actually use some more realistic instruments to create these underwater images. So one way we can create images of these plates deep in the ocean is by looking at the surface and the shape of the seafloor, which is called the bathymetry. And this is created by sending sound energy through the water in a wide fan, allowing it to bounce off the seafloor and return back to the ship, kind of like a whale uses echolocation to reflect sound to locate objects. We can then process that information into images like this, here we can see the colors are showing the depth to the sea floor off the Washington coast with warm colors being shallow and cool colors being deep, highlighting the prominent canyons that funnel mud and sand from the continent out into the open ocean. We can also create images of the rock beneath the sea floor. So now we get to think of this as our x-ray vision. This requires the tools that I was highlighting on that research boat. So first, we have another instrument that creates energy via sound waves, powerful enough to travel through the ocean and penetrate the ocean rocks, reflecting not just off the surface, 
but also different boundaries within the rock. We can think of this as that X-ray using energy to penetrate beyond the seafloor. So this energy, as it bounces off different layers and travels back up to the surface, where we use a long streamer or cable, which you can see coiled up in green on the boat, that has lots of little hydrophones or underwater microphones that record the arrival of this energy back at the surface. So we can use these records to create images like this one, which was collected on a cruise in 2012, showing us underground fractures or faults in the rock, as well as basins that collect recently deposited mud and sand. But what really is this image showing us? So to understand these images, we have to talk a little bit more about what a typical subduction zone looks like, specifically this area offshore, right above the plate boundary. And while I wish we could keep using our bone analogy, it's much easier to explain using a bulldozer. So we first wanna imagine the upper continental plate as this rigid bulldozer. The incoming plate, oceanic plate, is covered with thick layers of mud and sand that collide and wants to subduct or dive into the earth. This is happening very slowly over a long period of time since these plates are colliding at only centimeters per year, essentially how fast our nails grow. And as this happens, the bulldozer scrapes the material off the top of that downgoing plate. And this creates a pile of material in front of the bulldozer that spreads out as it grows to create a wedge. And this perhaps explains why we call it uh, an accretionary wedge. Material is accreting to the continental plate or adding to the continental plate in the shape of a wedge. And this process of adding more and more material to the front of the wedge produces fractures or faults within the wedge as it deforms and tries to stabilize its shape. And so these faults slip and break at different times to accommodate the interaction between these two plates at the plate boundary uh, below and the growth of the accretionary wedge. So creating images of this area of the subduction zone helps us get a better idea of how plates in Cascadia have interacted through time and how surrounding fractures and faults develop. Perhaps we can indeed bring it back to our athlete who as they're growing stronger, impacting their bones with heavy weight and repetitive motion can develop these small stress fracture cracks in their bones over time. Okay, so now we know that the largest magnitude earthquakes happen along the plate boundary in this area. The distribution of these surrounding overlying faults are then rather important and add complexity to this area. Not only do we have that plate boundary fault between the top plate with the accretionary wedge and the bottom Juan de Fuca plate, we also have these surrounding small scale fractures and faults in the accretionary wedge. And the presence of these additional faults complicate the potential breaks that can occur for Cascadia. So some of these surrounding faults reach from that major plate boundary to near the sea floor. And this creates different, different potential paths for earthquakes to spread from a major break along the plate boundary and continue to the surface to create tsunamis. When an earthquake, oh sorry, when a tsunami happens farther from the coastline in deeper water, it is able to displace more water when it breaks, therefore creating a larger tsunami. So these images now also show us the potential range of hazards that the subduction zone has hidden beneath the surface. The images that I've been involved collecting off the coast of Washington actually provide even more detail than the images that I've been showing you so far. Not only can we see these larger faults that reach the plate boundary shown in that middle image, but we can also see additional smaller faults within the basins of, of the accretionary wedge shown in the bottom right. So these basins can form as part of the accretionary wedge between the faults displacing the added material within the wedge as it's compressed together. These basins then collect mud and sand that comes off the continent out of the water and out of the water through time with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest or most recently deposited at the top. These layers can then be deformed as the wedge continues to grow, being squeezed together and uplifting along the basin edges from the colliding plates. They can also be offset or um, displaced by faults that intersect the basins. Faults that offset the youngest top layers of mud and sand 
show us faults that have been active very recently and could potentially actually be active right now. So looking at these details of the images that we've collected and I've interpreted here below, this essentially shows us where and how the accretionary wedge has grown and deformed over time. Again, showing us where fractures have broken recently or where they may currently be breaking the seafloor. And so these are all the different lines that our ship traveled along the Cascadia subduction zone in the summer of 2019 to create these high resolution images. And while the lines are limited, you can see the colored seafloor below shows areas where research cruises have created um, other images of the seafloor and potentially additional images of the rock below. And so through many decades of research, research like this, looking at these types of images, scientists have developed maps of the different fractures and faults that are present over this portion of the subduction zone some that are currently active and some that haven't been active for a very long time, but help us create a better picture of Cascadia as a whole. So if we have all these images and maps of potential faults and fractures, can we predict when Cascadia will have a broken bone? Well, just because we're getting, we're beginning to get a better idea of the distribution of different faults within the accretionary prism, doesn't mean that it's clear that one path would break over another. From other subduction zones, we can see that there are many different ways that a break could happen. Just like if we had an X-ray of potential weaknesses or tiny cracks in a bone, there still could be a few possible ways a break could happen. We could think of this as the complexity of trying to predict how the frozen surface of a large pond would crack or a window can shatter. So all of these ways an earthquake can break from these additional faults over such a large area, the changes in the different degrees of associated shaking and potential tsunamis, not to mention earthquakes don't always happen the same way twice, all leads us to the fact that it's impossible for scientists to predict exactly how and when an earthquake would happen, just like we can't predict how, exactly how and when an athlete's bone would break. And while this might be a letdown, <laughs> The research I do and others have done in the past collecting these images is crucial for getting the most understanding we can to anticipate all these different ways the big one could happen. Imaging the subsurface and mapping these faults, um, seeing which have been active more recently or not, as well as how they interact with that large locked plate boundary, is all necessary to create models like this one that helps inform residents about where intense shaking would occur for different earthquake scenarios. This would directly influence your experience of an earthquake, if your plane would land or how much the ground would roll, just like I mentioned for Nisqually. So scientists can use this information to provide resources for the public to learn and become better informed about the risks that potential areas are exposed to across this region. The Washington Geologic Information Portal is a great resource to better understand where there are active faults, where intense shaking and tsunami waves would reach for different earthquakes, and to explore other effects of the local rock types beneath your feet. And of course, these resources and knowledge can lead, the, lead to better public preparedness. While that Olympic uh, training athlete might have an ice pack on hand for sore muscles or even crutches for when a break does happen, we can create emergency kits to prepare ourselves in case of an earthquake. And there are many resources online to help you figure out what you need. These sorts of preparations give me peace of mind that I am doing all I can with the, re with the information I have available to me. So let me just finish by reminding you these large earthquakes are thought to happen in Cascadia every 300 to 500 years or so. Scientists at UW say that the chances of this large earthquake happening are 14% in the next 50 years. Now this is very low. This is essentially the same odds of an Olympic athlete taking home a medal during the Olympic games. And while I don't really know the specific odds as an athlete, you're probably not very likely to have a sudden broken bone situation happen many times in your life. So while my research certainly doesn't stop these earthquakes from happening, just like we can't always stop a bone from breaking, knowing these chances and also how we can prepare ourselves with the images and information available hopefully shows you that we can't let the fear of these things keep us from living life and striving for Olympic sized dreams. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Emma. 
I uh, just want to remind the audience, if you have questions for Emma, put those in the chat. And you can also text them uh, to the number in the chat. All right, our final speaker is Tammy Van Neal. Tammy is a PhD candidate in the chemistry department at the University of Washington. She develops analytical tools and methods to study how cells communicate with each other using beads that capture small, short-lived signaling molecules. Uh, she's a fourth year PhD candidate and enjoys uh, things that she's enjoying, enjoys outside the lab are exploring the Pacific Northwest beauty, cooking, and taking care of her plant babies. Um, please join me in welcoming Tammy Van Neal. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me just get my screen up. Okay. Have you ever wanted to be a spy? Gath going undercover, um, gathering intel, or even passing along secret coded messages? I personally love a good spy story and getting a glimpse into the lives of these James Bond characters because they make being a spy look really fun and exciting. But honestly, the idea of being on the run 24 seven sounds like a stressful way to live life. So while I might not be a spy in real life, I do get to live up my fantasies by spying on the cells that make up our bodies. This represents a billion cells and our bodies actually have trillions of cells in them roughly 35 trillion. And they all work together to make sure that our bodies stay functioning. But how do they know what to do? Cells make and pass messages or chemical signals back and forth to each other. And those messages contain information that tells the cell the next action it should take at any given moment. Now this usually starts by a cell responding to some outside event, like a cut on your finger. The cell then makes a chemical signal and releases it so a neighbor cell can receive it. That neighbor cell will then read and translate that message before deciding what message it needs to make as a response. Once it writes a new message, it will send it to another neighbor cell, starting this chain reaction of passing code, coded notes and messages back and forth. This process is called signaling where just one exchange between two cells is called a signaling event. And this exchange of messages is what our cells use to communicate that important information so that we can keep our bodies stay functioning, especially when we're fighting off different threats like a virus, for instance. Now, before I talk about how our bodies use signaling to fight off things like the flu virus, I do first wanna introduce the immune system and its key players. The immune system is a large network of cells, chemical signals, and tissues that are all connected by the bloodstream. And there are sort of two lines of defenses against threats like viruses. Your first line of defense is the innate immune system, which quickly jumps into action. You can think of this like local law enforcement will respond to any and all calls. Their job is to find the threat as quickly as possible and try to neutralize it. And now your second line of defense is the adaptive immune system, which is a little more specialized. They're kind of more like the FBI. So they first wait and see what those innate system cells are dealing with before they decide to launch a more coordinated attack against threats. Now, all the cells pictured here are known, generally speaking, as immune cells, with these two highlighted cells being white blood cells. As a quick side note, did you know that there are many different types of cells that make up white blood cells actually? It's not just these two, um, and that white blood cells aren't just one type of cell either, which I think is a pretty cool fact. So now they're, these are sort of the key players involved, but what do they actually do? Your immune system controls a lot of different cellular responses, but one of the most, one of the most important is inflammation. Inflammation is the reason you will feel pain, warmth, redness, and or swelling at the site of an injury, like maybe when you get a flu shot. But it's also a huge part in many diseases and illnesses, some of which you might be familiar with and are listed here on this slide. Now, I said that the cells are part of, I said that the cells that are part of the immune system is signaling to control inflammation. It also controls a lot of other things. Um, and I also said that I would explain how our cells are signaling to fight off the flu. 
So I'd like to do that now. This is the flu virus, and I'm sure everyone here has had the flu at least once in their life. When inhaled or ingested, the flu virus can make you sick for a few days. One part of understanding why we get sick or how our bodies get rid of the flu is by studying how our cells communicate with each other. So when you inhale that virus, it first travels into your nose or mouth and down um, your trachea and into your lungs. Now let's just zoom in on what's happening here in the lungs then. What we can see here on the side are lung cells, these black um, and white little dots or circles. And when the virus enters your lungs, the lung cells will then realize that it's been compromised and immediately starts to send out health messages um, pictured in purple to white blood cells for some backup. The white blood cells will then use your bloodstream to travel to your lungs. They identify what the threat is, in this case, the flu virus, and make a plan of action for how to destroy it, kind of like those more specialized FBI um, cells. This process will typically include sending out new signals to other immune cells to come and help remove that threat. Once the virus has been neutralized, immune cells will retreat and your symptoms will subside. A few days later, you can say that you feel better and are officially flu free. Now getting rid of that virus um, from your lungs is possible because your cells communicated with each other through those chemical signals. It's, it was only after studying the signals that cells use that scientists were able to determine what parts of the flu virus were actually infecting cells and causing some damage. This then led to the development of the flu shot, which provides us with some protection against the flu virus. And this is part of the reason why studying signaling is so important, because without understanding what's happening, we would never have been able to develop this, this flu shot. So again, we know a lot about how our body fights the flu because we've studied the chemical signals the cells use. But what if your immune, system, your immune cells got a little too excited and stayed on alert for a little too long? In the case of this example, this overstimulation could lead to your lungs becoming inflamed, which could make it difficult to breathe. Kind of like what happens when people have asthma attacks. It's because those immune cells kept sending signals and the original message got lost in translation which led, and the immune cells didn't actually realize that the fight was over. So how do we figure out what went wrong in these um, situations? It can be a little bit difficult to see what's going on inside the body. And sometimes it's a little easier to look at these questions inside the lab. We can grow cells outside of our bodies in containers under the right set of conditions. So what's pictured here is again, those black, um, and white little circles are cells, and you can see that they're just in a little container. We can, grow, we can grow these cells outside of the bodies in containers in the right set of conditions, which means that our cells are submerged in a liquid that contains a lot of other nutrients and chemical signals to help them grow and behave somewhat like they would in our bodies. Um, as an example, this is actually what a cell culture looks like. So we can see here that the cells pictured um, are green in this case, and they were submerged in a liquid that had a green dye um, so that we can actually see them a little bit better when we take pictures of them using microscopes. And all the black area is just that container where there are no cells present. So we can use these cell cultures because it allows us to simplify complex biological systems and isolate what we're actually interested in. Like if I wanted to know what was happening in my lungs during an, in, during an infection, I probably don't also need to study what's happening in my toes at the same time. So um, explaining in more detail, if we sort of take a slice down from the top to the bottom of these containers, what we'd see is this sort of 2D image um, pictured here. So again, those white little dots are cells and all the little colored dots are different chemical signals. This means that we can grow um, cells over a few days time so that they can sort of grow and expand themselves. And um, over time, they'll also create more chemical signals and just release them into their environment. After a few days, we can um, actually collect that liquid, that cell culture liquid, and analyze it to see what's present in it. But what if some of those signals disappeared? 
over time, meaning that we weren't actually able to analyze them. See, not all chemical signals are made the same way. Now, I'd like you to imagine you were just given an assignment to spy on two people, and so you've planted some listening devices in a bar that you know that they're going to be meeting in. When the two people or the cells are far apart, it's like recording a conversation when the bar is completely empty. Because there's no other background noise, you can clearly hear that conversation and know exactly what those two people talked about. In these cases, the signal hangs around in the cell culture liquid for so long that you can analyze them. And so you know that they were used for part of that cell communication. When the cells are next to each other, however, the conversation is so discreet, it's like trying to record a whisper when the bar is packed with people chatting. The message gets lost in the background and disappears so quickly after the cell sends it that by the time you analyze that cell culture liquid, you didn't even realize it was there to begin with leaving you a little bit confused about what the cells were even trying to say to each other. Oftentimes, it's the chemical signals used during these quick, discrete exchanges that are critical to understanding what went wrong to begin with. They're sort of the missing words that we need to understand the mystery of what is happening in our bodies when signaling goes haywire. Like I mentioned before, the methods people use to study cell signaling relies on analyzing the liquid that is removed from cell cultures. This method is usually okay when the messages you're studying last a long time. But when you're looking for messages that disappear quickly, this method is slow, and by the time the liquid can be analyzed, those disappearing messages are already gone. To solve this problem, I have created a new method that records messages before they can disappear so that they can be analyzed. I record those messages by planting microscopic listening devices in cell cultures using these tiny beads. So let's take a closer look at what these beads are. These beads um, on the surface contain these antibodies, which are proteins that trap chemical signals. And with the help of these antibodies, I can capture very specific chemical signals on the bead surface. So what I do is I add the beads into my cell cultures where they actually sit on the surface of the cells. As the cells are sending their disappearing messages, the antibodies then trap, the antibodies on the beads then trap the signals immediately after it, it's been released and sent so that they don't actually disappear and I have a record of them. And what this actually looks like in reality for my experiments are again, we have those green cells and we can see these pink little dots everywhere which are actually my microscopic listening devices. Once my experiment's done, I can then collect those beads, analyze the messages they've recorded and translate them to figure out what the cells were trying to communicate. So now after I made my tiny beads, I needed, or my tiny devices, I actually had to test them to see if they would actually record any disappearing messages. So to do this, I set up two different experiments. I used the, I used the old way um, where I cultured cells, and then I added in these antibodies. And the antibodies just served as a way to remove any chemical signals, kind of like if another cell were to use that um, signal for something else and therefore making it disappear. Um, so over time, as the cells were growing and secreting their messages, these antibodies would trap that original message or signal. I then collected that liquid and analyzed it using um, just an instrument. For my uh, other experiment, what I did was, again, I just cultured, I cultured cells. I grew them in these containers. And then instead of just an adding in antibodies, I also added in my beads to the um, to the cell cultures so that over time as the cells were releasing their messages they would actually first see my beads and then get trapped by the antibodies on that surface before just roaming around in the liquid to be captured by something else i was then able to then collect the beads and again analyze them with an instrument now i'd like to also note that um, i also had another parallel set of conditions where the antibodies um, that I that I added in the second step were not present to serve as a more control and baseline experiment as well to see 
um, how many signals were actually being released at any given time. So what were my, re what were my results? Um, with the old method, um, we can see that the messages were still disappearing quite quickly. So what I have here on this graph are just the number of the chemical signals that I was looking for. And then we have the two different conditions that I um, walked through. We have one where there are no antibodies and we have one where there are those blue antibodies. And we can see that the signal is quite low. It's about 25,000 um, of these chemical signals that were counted. Versus my new method, we can see that my listening devices actually recorded these fast um, disappearing messages. So again, I just have the, the number of the chemical signals and the two different conditions that I tested. Now what these results show are that many of the key disappearing messages are actually not being recorded with the old method. And we can see this because there's a huge difference between the number of signals in the old method versus my new method. And this sort of means that my method my method of recording a lot of those messages indicates that this message or the signal might actually play a bigger role in the signaling between these the cells than we might have realized if we had used um, the old, old method. So by using my method and spying on cells, we can start to identify these disappearing messages and build a better understanding of how different diseases and illnesses work. In this way, we can start to fill in the missing words cells are using and slowly decipher the full conversation. Maybe we first focus on one sentence, looking at signaling between just the lung cells and blood cells. Then we start to add some more complex, um, some more complexity to the system by looking at the lung cells, the blood cells, and the immune cells. And eventually we start to get the complete story. This way, we can systematically learn more about how, cell, how cells are communicating and identify what chemical signals are important so that hopefully one day in the future, we can find cures for diseases and treat illnesses more effectively. Thank you for your time and attention here tonight. All right, great job, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Tammy, for that. Uh, so now we're going to move into questions. Um, audience, you have plenty of time still. If you want to submit questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but we're going to start with Sarah first. So uh, first question, can you talk about how uh, we're going back to proteins. Um, so can you talk about how you take pictures and measure distances between proteins? What does that look like in your lab? So in our lab, we have essentially giant magnets. And what we do is you can't see the, but we take our, we prepare any protein of interest, whatever you want to study, um, and you attach the electrons. So the electrons occur naturally, but they're not usually on the proteins. So we have to attach them to the proteins. And then we, you know, make our sample and we basically just stick it inside a giant magnet. And then we can use what are actually microwaves, so like the microwaves that your microwave produces, and we can make pulses and we can uh, shift, like we can hit everything. And so it changes the magnetism, like it changes the magnetism that we record and that's how we get the distances. That was a little bit fudged, but I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so in, in that answer, I think it kind of answered this question. Um, do you have a particular type of protein that you, you focus on in your research? It sounds like you're saying that people kind of bring you the protein that they would like you to study. Yeah, so in our lab, we, um, we do a lot of method development. So a lot of what I talked about was kind of expanding on the specific method to use these electrons to, um, to measure distances. And, but other groups or some people in the lab do study specific specific proteins, but what I do specifically is more just on the method rather than a system. Okay. Um, and this was like a kind of small part of your presentation, but um, can you, um, and maybe I missed it, can you um, describe what a ligand is? Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so a ligand is, is just like a, another small molecule, so it has um, it's not like quite the size of a protein, but it has a very specific role. So it has like basically like, what's the right word? 
like opposite uh, kind of components so that it can bind, so it can come together with the protein. And what it does is then activate certain things on the protein so that it can move or so that it can do its various other jobs. So it's basically like a little bit of like a, a push to get the protein to do what it needs to do. It's just a small molecule. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then last question, uh, what kind of brought you to this research? How did you get into studying proteins? What, what, what is interesting about it to you? Uh, I think that proteins are really cool because we kind of, everyone knows them on this, on this idea, like I talked about at the beginning of these things that we eat, but uh, people don't actually understand that they are these, these molecules that, that literally have a hand in everything that we do. So basically any disease you can think of, anything that your any way that your body functions, anything living, whether it's people or animals or plants, like there are proteins that have a role in that. And so you can really, you can look at any system from it. And it's just such a cool way to, to like kind of shrink the world down and see how we have these, these tiny little things that kind of control everything. And then, and then my research specifically uh, was just, it was something new that I hadn't heard of. Like it was a way I had never really heard of that we'd studied proteins before. And I thought that was really cool. cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. It's definitely not something that um, I've <laughs> ever realized. <laughs> so thank you for uh, bringing that yeah. to us tonight. Um, so now for Emma, um, I had the, so this first question, uh, can earthquakes cause volcanic eruptions? And if so, how, how would you think volcanoes around Seattle would be impacted by the quote unquote big one? That is a good question um, and not something I have a lot of direct experience with, um, but I know that I would say it's not very likely that um, an earthquake like this would trigger like an erup a, a large eruption of like Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens. Um, usually their processes are kind of separate um, and they're more going to be influenced by things that are more local to those volcanoes. Um, that being said, you know, if there was some sort of like large earthquake in the vicinity of that volcano and it was like very primed and ready, it, you still probably would know based off like smaller earthquakes happening around that volcano that it was going to erupt and, and maybe that big one would like push it over the edge. But I, I would say it's very unlikely that a large earthquake like this would be the sole reason that a volcano would be erupted. Um, does the method that is used to map undersea faults generate sound waves powerful enough to pose a risk to marine mammals? And if so, how do you mitigate that risk? That's a, another great question. Um, yes, it does. So when we're dealing with um, sound sources like this, right? We, we do need enough energy to penetrate into the seafloor. So that is a lot of energy and that is a significant underwater explosion. The, and so it does affect marine mammals. Um, that is certainly true, but the scientific community does a really, um, good job at mitigating and trying to prevent as much impact as they can. So on cruises like the ones I've been on, we always have a set um, marine mammal observing set of marine biologists. So they are constantly watching for marine life. They're also monitoring for marine life, even um, underwater that they can't see visually with acoustics. So that if we know there are marine mammals within the vicinity, especially those that are endangered or more highly susceptible to noises like this, we can shut down our operations and wait until they leave the area. It's also a difficult thing to navigate because we're talking about research that could potentially help people prepare for pretty catastrophic events. And so you have to start to weigh those risks of, of being a temporary noise source um, and gaining really important information but also recognizing that we are only one of the many really large noise sources in the ocean, like shipping containers or fishing vessels or things like that, that are, or even commercial oil exploration that are constantly going on versus this is more of a temporary um, added noise source in the ocean. Um, a lot of this feels outside of human control 
Um, but is there anything about human activity that affects the likelihood of earthquakes? Um, that is a good question too. Um, you're right. It can kind of feel overwhelming to be like, well, I have no control of when this will happen or how this will happen. Um, and so to a certain extent, no, there's not anything in particular that you need to do to change your life in Seattle or in the Northwest. Um, but it has been observed things like fracking can induce earthquakes. So when you're removing oil from the ground and then injecting that wastewater that is produced during fracking back into the ground, that injection of water can essentially break cracks in the ground that then can produce earthquakes. And so earthquakes have definitely been connected to human impact in areas like Oklahoma um, for these reasons, but especially here in the Northwest, when we're thinking about those larger offshore earthquakes, there's nothing really that you can or can't do to influence this. Um, and then last question, um, since you're someone who thinks about this a lot, and I, I mean, I feel like I think about it a lot too, just like knowing that it could happen, Yeah. Um, but you think about it more clearly. Um, <laughs> can you tell us how you're uh, personally prepared for an earthquake and what you would recommend we do to prepare ourselves? Yeah, definitely. I have to say, I know my mom was watching and she's not anymore, but I have a plug for her. She actually made my emergency kit. So I have an emergency kit in my house and in my car. I think it's important to have multiple emergency kits because you might not be in your house when, uh, you know, something happens. Um, and so I try to have a kit kind of in these two set places as food, has water, it has maybe like an old coat or an old pair of shoes that I don't really use. Um, I also think it's important to think about um, in Seattle, what, what is your evacuation route? If like bridges go down or if, you know, an area that is susceptible to being really impacted in an earthquake, how are you going to get in touch with your family and, and where do you know to go? And so I think like having a kit and kind of having a plan are the two kind of major things that I think a lot of people should consider when they live in an earthquake prone area. Probably stay away from I-5. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the Olympics, like go to the coast, enjoy your life. You know, it's just trying to do the things you can do to prepare. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. And Tammy, um, so we're going back to thinking about cells. Um, I'm curious about where do you get the cell specimens? Um, is it hard to come by that kind of thing? Could you just make them? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, a lot of cell work is actually done with immortalized cell lines. So one example of this might you, that some people might have heard of um, are the HeLa cells, which were isolated from Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks and they were cancerous cell lines. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of times we're just using these immortalized cell lines that um, come from cancer samples and are really easy to handle and grow in lab settings. Um, the other version is like you're isolating them from actual patients um, and those that's usually not common. Um, that's usually very for specific studies and things like that. Um, but then you would isolate them from tissue um, that are extracted from someone during a surgery, for instance. So the immortalized ones that they just they just kind of keep, um, it's kind of like a sourdough starter. Like you kind of just have it. And it, is that what it's like? Um, honestly, yeah, it's kind okay. of like a sourdough starter. Um, and I mean, there are many different types of cells in your body. So like there's many different cell lines that you can purchase and things like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, what is an example of a chemical signal that is short lived? Um, and also what what are the time frames that we are talking about? What's fast? What's slow? Um, how, and how long does it take to collect the signals in, in your new method? Yeah, so I guess generally speaking, whether it's fast or uh, like short lived or it's a longer lasting signal is kind of just dependent about what's happening in your body at any given time. So um, if you, for instance, have an inflammatory disease like arthritis, you probably have a lot of these signals that are just 
constantly present at higher levels than someone who doesn't experience something like that. So it is very specific to, you know, whatever is currently maybe happening in you. Um, but I can, so for an, as an example, um, interleukin-6 is, is a chemical signal that some people might have heard of because it is one of these signals that are part of your immune response and are, is kind of being looked at for um, COVID treatments and therapies. And so that might tend to like last a really long time in your body if you're like currently experiencing symptoms, but it'll actually rapidly degrade or be removed um, from your blood, for instance, if like past those symptoms. Um, so like you might not experience that for that long. The time scales, again, kind of depend on what you're looking at and what you're looking for. It can last anywhere from literal milliseconds to, you know, a few days or even hours to hang around in your body. So what I'm specifically looking at are these like really short ones where there are a few milliseconds present. Um, and so the distance, at least in my current method, the distance that a signal has to travel from when it's being released from a cell to the surface of the beads is almost 10 times smaller than the width of a single hair strand. It's a very short distance. Um, so very quick, I would say that my beads are capturing these things versus if they sort of travel a little, if it takes like a few milliseconds to travel from the cell surface to somewhere else in this, in this container, um, it's actually enough time for it to be removed. So it's sort of a really broad general answer to a more specific question, but um, hopefully that helps. Yeah, puts it in context. Which is yeah. Um, and I want to ask you kind of the same question that I asked Sarah, what, what kind of got you into this? What are you, um, what are, what are your uh, hopes for um, once you have uh, received your PhD? Um, and what's, you know, what, it, what is interesting about this to you? Yeah, so I actually didn't start working on this type of work until two years into my PhD. So, I'm, you know, I've been working on it for a little over two years now. Um, and what I find really fascinating about this work is it's kind of like puzzles to me. So, you know, you are kind of given like, here's all these signals, like figure out what was happening in the culture at that time and like why these signals were made or like what's their purpose. Um, because there are many times when, you know, the cells again are constantly communicating with each other. So you don't actually know why something might be present and if it's like the start of something more serious happening. Um, so I like the challenge because it's kind of like building little puzzles or like figuring out what went wrong or like who did what. Um, and so long term, you know, I want to stay within this work because I think it's sort of the it's what we call basic science research, where it's the first step to really understanding um, the larger picture for like our bodies and our health and like how do we make treatments and like. Um, that's why vaccines can be developed a lot faster these days um, and things like that. So it's like really just trying to understand like more about how cells are working, how diseases progress. Can we stop it at earlier stages? Like what are the what are the markers for something happening in our body? Um, but that's why I like it. So long term, I want to stay in this work. Um, but yeah. Cool. So it's like really foundational. Um really foundational study that helps a lot, a big, big range of yeah. different things. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for bringing uh, your fascinating research. Um, and it's, it's also relevant. Uh, so it's really great to, great to learn about. I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you for uh, watching and thank you for your questions. Um, it's really great to see the community support um, for the students and their work. So our next UW Engage Science event is next Monday, May 17th. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Uh, but until then, stay safe and have a great night.